Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Hi, my name is Eileen Rubel. I'm a technical director in the Software Solutions Division here at the Software Engineering Institute. With me today is my colleague, Bill Nichols, who recently published research that challenged the veracity and the relevance of the widely held notion of the 10x programmer. This work has generated a lot of attention, and so, Bill, I'm excited to have you here to talk with me about it today. Thank you. So before we uh, before we dive uh, down into the blog post and the IEEE column, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about you and the path that uh, the path that you've been on here at the SCI that got you into this work? Okay. Well, I started out uh, I started out in particle physics. My PhD is actually in physics, and that's where I started programming. That's where I developed a more uh, quantitative bent. And some of my friends at the time were also involved in things like uh, sabermetrics and analysis. Mm-hmm. And later on, when I was working at the laboratory, I spent 15 years developing scientific codes for analyzing nuclear reactors. Uh, I became interested in in how we could get better performance from our teams and our work. And we went into a major re-engineering program at the laboratory, and I was leading a development team to re-engineer a bunch of old codes. And Watts Humphrey and several others from the SEI came and talked to us. And they talked about the PSP, and I said, wow, this is exactly what I was looking for. This is a way to really apply the quantitative measures to software. Well, after uh, working on this project for about five years at the laboratory, I ended up coming to the SEI so I could see how things are working in the rest of industry and start teaching others a lot of things I'd learned about how to measure software, how to improve team performance, Mm -hmm. and you know, basically how to get the most out of your software development. And so for our, our viewers and listeners who aren't familiar with uh, PSP, that's the personal software process, which is the individual uh, component or counterpart to the TSP or the team software process. That's right. The TSP is what we actually used in the development. The PSP was really a training mechanism. It was a technique to teach people how to record and use the data that they would actually uh they would actually implement on projects, on team projects, how to do things like report your status, how to track your progress, how to measure improvements. And so that work was the genesis for the column that you wrote in uh, IEEE Software and the resulting blog post uh, that uh, that uh, combats the myth of the, uh, the 10X programmer. That's right. Okay, so um, why don't we start there? Can you explain a little bit, um, in case we have viewers or listeners who aren't familiar with this idea of the 10x programmer, um, what's you know what's the idea behind that, and why did you decide to take that on? Well, there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of different ideas here, and I want to be clear on which one I'm actually addressing. There's this idealized concept of the times 10 programmer that you sometimes hear people, what they're really referring to are the super programmer, the uh, Mm -hmm. Sidney Crosby or the uh, Tom Brady of programmers uh, who can do anything. But what I'm looking at is a more literal definition. There have been many studies, many studies that actually measured the performance of programmers uh, by, by giving them all the same program and measuring how long it took. And they found mm-hmm. pretty consistently it took the the fastest was at least 10 times faster than the slowest. Now, I had a lot of data I could look at, but there are other things that, uh, there are other things about that result that, that continued to nag and bother me. Okay. Um, so what factors did you look at uh, when you started to dig into this and sort of, you know, scratch that itch of the things that mm-hmm. were bothering you? Well, we looked at a lot of different factors that we had in the data, uh, but what we really, uh, what I really wanted to hone in on is how long did it take people to write the same program. So we had this set of ten exercises that a lot of different people had taken, and I looked primarily for each individual program. They each did the same ten. How long did it take them? Uh, that was the primary measure. Although there are lots of other measures that we have. We have defects. We have the size of the programs. We have the time they spent doing different activities. 
I was just looking at the beginning to end time. How long did it take? Okay. Um, did anything about this surprise you, you know, once you once you dug under the covers? Well, there were some things that were that were surprising. I mean, I wasn't completely shocked, but when I looked at the scale of the difference, I was really surprised. Uh, the Times 10 programmer, I said, was highly replicated. You got it everywhere mm -hmm. that you saw. Now, we kind of knew that that might be a bit of an exaggeration from teaching this class. We always knew that the same people weren't always the first and the last finishers, that there was some variation. Right. So when I started looking at the, uh, at the data, I did a fairly sophisticated type of analysis that looked at the variation. And what struck me was the variation within a programmer, within a programmer's own 10 programs, was comparable to the variation between programmers. That is, the within difference was as big as between. The scale of that, that they were so comparable, was really very surprising. Uh, I shared that with Tim Menzies, who was the editor for the IEEE column on redirections. And he said, that's a really interesting result, but this is too abstract, it's too hard to understand, no one's gonna understand how you did this. Mm -hmm. So, decided to make it uh, a little simpler. What I did was I took the, basically I, I ranked every developer on each program. Uh, from one through 500, we had a sample of about 500 programmers who wrote in C. Okay. So, okay, one through 500. And I did this for each of the 10 programs. And then I compared their, uh, compared the range and I found, oh, the average top and bottom performance of each program in this rank spanned 250. 250 out of 500. That was an enormous range. I was sh that's what really surprised me, that this range was so large. And the other thing that kind of surprised me was here we had this, this uh, historic set of experiments. You know, it started with Sackman. It's been replicated countless times. They always showed the same thing. The best and worst mm -hmm. uh, had this factor of 10. Okay, I look at my data. I see that for each individual program. But then I look at the span of it and I do things like, how do the medians, how do the medians distribute? And Oh, it's not nearly as wide. So we had this funny situation where the research actually replicated. It wasn't a replication crisis type of problem, but it was still wrong because no one had done the repeated measures. No one had actually seen the individual variation. That Those huge variations they saw were at least half a result of noise from how long it takes me to write a particular program on a given day. Okay, so um, correct me if I'm, if I if I don't get to this correctly, but um, my takeaway was that um, the the ver a lot of that variation was actually, you know, in terms of the individual and their performance on a given day, and not so much the one x individual and and the ten x individual, um, and that the factors that the, the environmental factors I'll use that term loosely, um, in which they're operating the teaming environments, uh, the physical environment, having you know quiet and appropriate spaces to work. Work, that those are areas uh, um, to focus to really achieve productivity gains as opposed to hunting for um, unicorn software yeah. engineers or well, try to hire rock stars. I'm actually going to start to address some of those questions in some future blogs. Okay. And the quiet space is really important. But the interesting thing was we gave these people quiet space. We saw this variation even without okay. it. When you start putting in real environments, the the day-to-day -day differences become far more extreme. And that's what we saw with some of the TSP data, and that's what I'll we'll start talking about in the next blog, some of the findings from that. Uh, but yeah, it's if you're, if you're trying to make a productive software team, you're gonna be hard pressed to really up the productivity by finding that super fast programmer. It doesn't mean that there aren't better programmers than others. We definitely saw differences. Right. Uh, it just means that the range of differences between your average program and your best aren't that big, and the person who was the slowest on a given day isn't really going to be the slowest on the next day, very likely. So the number of really super programmers is a lot smaller than you would thought. You're going to have a hard time finding a team of them.
Mm -hmm. And most of the variation turns out the uh, the distribution isn't a Bell's curve. It's more log normal, uh, long tail. Why do people get stopped on programs? So they could be they chose a poor design and made something bigger than it had to be. Mm -hmm. They got into some bug that they just couldn't track. Uh, how often do you get stuck on a bug? And the first person who looks over your shoulder says, "Oh, you did this wrong." <laughs> right. So, so one of the things I would carry forth is. Not only do you have to create an environment, but you really have to create a team environment so that you can catch those kinds of problems early. And that's why we have some other recommendations. Uh, there are a few things that came out of the Agile world that make a lot of sense, but never had a lot of theoretical foundation. And I think the small tasks is something that this kind of data supports. Why do you want a small task? Well, it's easier to estimate. It's easier to know when it's gone off the rails. and in a team environment, it gives you more opportunities to step in and fix the problem before it becomes a runaway. So those those small batch, fast learning cycle uh, kinds of approaches really seem to be borne out here. That would be one of the indicators, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, one of the things that we always like to emphasize in our podcast, and I know from working together, you certainly heard me talk about this a lot, um, is transition. Um, so aside from the things that we've talked about with um, physical environment and you know collaboration and teaming environment, um, if I'm a listener or viewer managing a team of software developers, um, what else might I want to think about or take away in terms of using these findings to help my team? Well, among the things that I would look at is uh, don't overreact to short-term variations. Variation happens right. for a lot of different reasons. And as a manager, it's very hard to tell why that is. That's one of the reasons that uh, we've always emphasized that the team has to be in charge of that process and the team has to be responsible for figuring out where the problems are because they're the ones closest to the problems. And what the manager has to do is be able to see when are things going wrong so that he or she can ask the right questions and get people to take corrective actions. That's probably the single biggest thing you can do. I have some other recommendations as far as the, uh, the tasks. Uh, this, this sort of thing raises questions about uh, how long you should let, um, how long your sprints should be, for example. If, you're, if this is your variation, if this, is, if this huge variation, well, it's no wonder people have a hard time estimating. Right. And if you make your sprint too short, a lot of the compensation is, well, we're going to make the sprints shorter and shorter and shorter. What happens when you reduce your sample size? The mm -hmm. uncertainty becomes bigger. So there's a point at which if you try to correct for these problems by just making your sprints shorter, you're going to make the problem worse. Right, so you get to you get to that point of diminishing returns yeah. in there if you try to slice it too fine. Yeah, and because the estimates are so coarse to begin with, you may not even know where that is. Well, that makes sense. There's a um, a friend, a colleague, colleague of ours, is very fond of saying you can be you can get to a point where you have you are very 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 precisely mm -hmm. wrong <laughs> by trying to slice it so fine. Um, so what I heard is don't. Um, don't get, uh, don't lose sight of the forest for the trees, <laughs> um, and push the, uh, you know, push decision making authority down to where the information lives with the developers, and then be able to, uh, you know, be able to take that that broad horizon view and know uh, know what the signals are that something's going off the rails, but don't get caught in the, the small right. perturbations. Yeah, the, a lot of the part of the manager is really creating a productive environment. Uh, the trick is knowing what you can do that will make the environment more, uh, more productive and more conducive to bringing your projects, your software development, and on time. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. I'm looking forward to seeing the next, um, the next set of blog posts uh, that you've talked about. Um, are you examining uh, any other related areas associated with software development productivity? Well, the project I'm working on right now is called Scope, and mm -hmm. we're looking at the causal connections. Uh, what are the factors that actually lead to productivity? And we're finding some interesting things. One of the th one of the reasons this project actually came out of scope, and it came out of a negative result, oddly enough. Okay. We were looking for what were the factors that lead to productivity, and I was looking at things like, well, uh, what about experience? Uh, what about total lines of how much code you wrote in a given language? Uh, what about degrees obtained? Nothing mattered. That's kind of what led me to looking at this variation problem. 
But now okay. we're but we have lots of other data uh, that we can look at with not only the PSP but the TSP, and trying to understand what are the causal factors that lead to things like quality, consistency, productivity. It's not just speed. That's not the only factor we're interested in. We're interested in good programs. We're interested in getting them and at predictable paces, not just right. the fastest, but make it predictable. Make them predictable. Make them fast. Uh, and we'll be looking at some of those within scope and also on side projects. There are lots of things in that TSP data that I would still love to investigate. Well, great. I look forward to to your continued work in this area and talking with you, uh, talking with you more as as we uncover you know more pieces of the the productivity puzzle. Uh, thanks so much for talking with me today, Bill. We'll include links in the transcript to all of the references that we've made during this podcast. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher. Tune in Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.